What's up, everybody? And welcome in to another difficult discussion, which it feels like we are always having on this channel. And I wanted to start the video today talking about the seriousness of the issue and the fact that it is a tragedy, incredibly sad for the lives lost. There will be no discussion from me about how they deserved it or, you know, rich people getting what they uh, should or play stupid games, get super prizes. There will be none of that. Um, but there are people that have reached out to me that follow the channel, watch the videos, which I always really appreciate. Um, I love when people tell me what they think and I love when people explain to me where they're at on different issues and different situations. Um, but a bunch of people were like way too soon. You shouldn't be talking about this case. Um, Etc. And I think they're probably newer to the channel because just about every single case we talk about on here has some kind of tragedy, either that were intentional actions or accidental actions, um, but that result in tragedy nonetheless. And I think the point is for us not to uh, belittle what happened, but just try to understand the surrounding situations um, and understand. It, yeah. And I, I see people saying, Oh my gosh, people are saying that it's okay. I don't, I understand it. And I've tried to respond to a lot of the messages saying, listen, the reason we talk about anything we talk about on this channel is because I'm getting questions about it. And a ton of people are asking questions about how this is possible, how you can take this risk risk. Um, what's in those waivers? Is that legit? Um, should this even be allowed? Should we be allowed to do things that are so dangerous, uncharted territories, literally? Um, and what can we do about it as a society and as the public and things like that? So that's what we're really going to talk about today. I hear people saying the video is blurry. Um, I am showing some connection issues here. So I apologize um, if the video is a little blurry. Hopefully it uh, fixes itself here as we start the video. But what we're going to do today is we are going to work our way through some of the videos that were posted by People that have done the passages before, uh, yeah, everybody's saying it's blurry. So here, I'll try changing it to turning the Wi-Fi on instead of the plug-in. The plug-in is supposed to be better, but, you know, technical issues are not something that we don't run into often on this channel. So, okay, I've turned on the Wi-Fi. Hopefully that fixes. Um, so we are going to talk about the legal angles. We are going to talk about waivers. We are going to talk about inherently dangerous activities. Um, we are going to talk about similar lawsuits that happened and cases that are similar to this plane crashes, um, roller coasters where people pass away, um, potentially due to someone else's fault. So we're going to talk about all that. We're going to compare those cases. Um, uh, Phil said, have you seen the memes on this tragedy? It's disgusting. I have not seen a lot of memes. Honestly, I have not. I've been watching some of the news channels following it. What I've really been interested in is the interviews that they're doing. And that's what we're going to listen to today. We are going to listen to a bunch of the interviews from people that have been on the, the sub before. So prior passengers that have seen the, um, that have seen the waiver. We are going to hear from the CEO who was on the sub and what he said about it beforehand and how he explained their testing and whether or not it's safe. Um, we are going to listen to interviews from the co-owner that is still with us and um, doing interviews. Sorry, I'm distracted and really annoyed at it being blurry. So I'm trying to I'm trying to work on that at the same time as I'm talking, which can be distracting. So I apologize for that. Um so yeah, so we're going to listen to all that and more, other experts and things like that. Um, I think a lot of it is from News Nation where I've gotten a lot of these clips because they've posted them on um, YouTube. So we will jump into that now. Hit the like button if you do want to hear about this, if you do want to still focus on the legalities of this and how society can look at this and how the legal system, the court system so often creates guardrails, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, right? That's why we have to have uh, seatbelts. That's why we have to have warning labels on things. That's why we have waivers. So people can actually know what they're getting into. All of that happened because of the legal system. 
because of the civil and criminal justice system. That is why we even have the waivers that were signed in this case. Is it enough? We'll talk about that. What did they know? We'll talk about that. How was it explained to them? We'll discuss all of that and how it can come into play. We'll also discuss whether or not we even expect lawsuits in this case. So let's get to it now. But like I said, hit the like button if you if you are interested in this. Let me know in the comments section. Subscribe to our page so you can continue to follow it with us. Um, we will try to do it in obviously the most respectful way possible. That's how we try to handle everything. I mean, if you go back and look at the entire list of videos we've done on this channel, it's, I mean, none of it's happy. Um, all right, here we go. And again, I apologize about the blurriness. I really hope the videos aren't blurry, um, but we will see how it goes. All right, here we go. You mentioned Oceangate was reportedly warned more than once that the submersible could face, quote, catastrophic problems if it did not pass existing safety guidelines. According to court documents, it was never inspected. The company's own director of operations was so worried that he urged in 2018 for more testing. That same year, Oceangate was sent a letter signed by dozens of industry leaders who had unanimous concern about the watercraft's experimental undertaking. Bart Kemper is a forensic engineer who works on submarine designs and is one of the leaders who signed that letter. Bart, thanks so much for being here. Uh so we are going to hear from an engineer that is an expert on this type of thing. And one of the things to keep in mind, right? When we talk about waivers and what happened in this case, you absolutely can waive your right to sue. You can waive your right to something bad happening, but you can't waive your right to somebody doing something intentionally from, from some fraudulent misrepresentation or absolute gross negligence that they absolutely knew they should have done something and didn't do it. So that's what we want to keep in mind as we're listening to what they knew well beforehand. Now, I do think a huge element of this is the CEO was, in fact, the guy who built the sub and was on it. So I don't think they did anything intentional. But we're going to talk about different people's knowledge and different things that maybe should have or could have been done beforehand. And just what did everyone know? Um you said in this letter, one of the 38 who signed this letter, that Oceangate was misleading when it said that the Titan met or exceeded safety guidelines. Um, what did Oceangate say in response? Well, to set the record straight, that letter was never actually sent. It was a draft that was formed up out of concern of the various people. I'm, I'm part of the small firm where independent engineers, others or manufacturers or suppliers all working in the same industry. And we had a concern about how Ocean Gate was operating. And that concern was, is, is, as was said earlier, is that the submarines are, are, are supposed to be built to certain standards. And then when they're tested and constructed, they, they go through what's called a classing society, which are takes the place of the Coast Guard in the US waters. These classing societies are the, if you will, the jurisdiction for vessels that go into international waters. They bypassed all that. And it was that bypassing of the normal due diligence, the, the standard of care that you, do, that you do for any engineering design, not just for submarines, not just for vessels, but right. uh, but what, why would you write this letter? And why would you write the letter and not send it to Ocean? So before we get to why they didn't send the letter, um, bad echo. People are saying, "Great, it's just going to be one of those days." I guess we'll try to fix it. But um, so one one of the reasons that this is a big deal is. They went into international water. They bypassed a lot of the um, certification and checking that had to be done, but that's not illegal on its own, right? So if they would have done it in waters where they needed it to be certified by one country or the other, then boom, you have a problem. But the fact that they're doing it in waters that you don't need that to happen is not on its own illegal or negligent. That's why it's set up the way that it's set up. And we're not necessarily going to get into a ton of maritime law or the Death on the High Seas Act, or things like that that could absolutely come into play and I think will come into play if lawsuits are filed. And again, we will talk um, about that more. John is actually here, which seems to be when the technical difficulties are at their worst. Um, but we will we will keep going. Let me just see what the speakers look like. Uh, yeah, that should be right. All right, let me know if the echo continues. 
gay? Because the, the letter was, was done through the auspices of the Marine Technology Society. Now, the thing is, that is, in, in a large print of its name, the Technology Society. If it started getting into trying to, to manage commerce and telling businesses how to operate, it would not only be outside of this charter, it, it would be potentially open to favoritism or some other lawsuit. And depending on the jurisdiction, it could get run afoul for government actions. It would be acting as a government agency. So what happened instead was there was an informal meeting. The, the letter was still drafted. Uh, it never got to the signature phase. But what the important thing was is that a number of other people who, who worked on that letter met with Stockton and had the conversations. And, and what did he say in response? And, and so even though the letter wasn't sent, people met with Stockton, who is the CEO, who was on the vessel, and they told him about the issues. And these are all experts. These aren't somebody like me who's looking at it saying, oh, it looks a little janky or whatever. I mean, this is like legitimate stuff. I hear all of the stuff about and we're going to hear some of it in these interviews about, you know, he was using an Xbox controller or whatever it may be. But if the Xbox controller worked, I don't see that in and of itself as negligence. Is it one of the things that when you stack it all up, it's like you should have known better? Maybe. But if these experts are telling you that's different, that's different. And this, the reason to play this letter is, I mean, this video is, when we talk about in these kinds of cases, what the company knew or should have known, are they on notice of X, Y, and Z? And once you can prove the company is on notice, then you have to see, did they tell the passengers? Did they hide it? Did the passengers know when they signed their waiver, what exactly they were waiving? And again, we're going to be building on this as if we're listening to evidence in a case. Right now, we are learning what the company knew. What were they on notice of? He did agree. Now I'm reporting what I heard from the people who were there. I was not there, but what he what, what happened was he changed a number of the things. There was more transparency about the nature of this being an experimental. It, he stopped saying that this is meets the standard because it was never tested to that standard. How can you say it meets or exceeds the standard if it? If so he used to say it meets the standard, but then he had to stop because it didn't in fact meet any standards. It's a problem. If it wasn't tested at all, let alone according to the standard. So those are the things. And you heard what he said. It, it's not tested at all. Thank you, Dan, for the smiley face. It's always good to get a good smiley face. It wasn't tested at all. That is going to be different than what other people say later on. So again, which is it? Maybe it was tested after this meeting in 2018. That we wanted to do at a minimum is to change his outward facing advertisements and what he was, how, how he was presenting it. So anyone who got involved would have a clearer picture of it. Part of what the, the, uh, the waiver that was talked about earlier, that waiver, that waiver was, was became what it is now through that conversation where it was very explicit. Right. This is an experimental. Part, part. And so here we go. Now some evidence for the other side for ocean gate after these meetings, they did change their waiver. They made it explicit. They wanted to make sure anybody that was going to get on this was going to know the risks, that it was not tested, that it was not approved or certified, that it was experimental. That's all really important. And again, we're learning things as we go. So it starts out by saying, this is not good. This is not how it's supposed to be done. But they put all that in the waiver, according to this guy, at least. Yes, it's possible. I, gu I guess I just want, yes. you're an expert in this field. Was this submersible safe? Should it have been doing missions like this? Had it been tested? That's, that's the problem. You don't know. If you don't test it, you don't know. If you don't build it to a standard, how do you know it's wrong? So that's the problem. But as an engineer, I will tell you this, that as you introduce more and more unknowns, more and more variables, things that are not established and tested, these, these innovations that, 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 that Stockton was bringing in, as you add in more and more of these, these variables that interact with each other, right. you increase the potential risk. Okay. And that's, and that's a problem. We don't know because it was never tested. So Our this camper. would be the type of expert testimony you could absolutely see in a trial to prove that OceanGate knew what they were doing was unsafe. They shouldn't have done it. They shouldn't have tested it. Blah, blah, blah. Right? I feel confident that that is going to be able to be proven. I feel confident. So to, to take it a step further and just talk about people have gotten upset saying no way there's going to be lawsuits um, because they signed waivers. By the way, 
I'm saying that's the first element. So they prove that Ocean Gate knew or should have known that this was dangerous. But again, they can get around it if they fully and completely explained that to the passengers and they still went on and still waved it. Okay, so I just want to make sure we're going step by step. So I don't want to think anybody thinks we're jumping to conclusions here. So, but number two is, if you don't think lawsuits are coming, then I don't think you've been paying attention to society over the last hundreds of years. So Scott, you just said something that we're going to get to as well. Um, so if you look at other things, you sign waivers on, let's talk about airplanes. Let's talk about carnival rides or roller coasters, surgeries. Those are a lot of what people have been sending me. All of those have death in the waivers. You all have signed them. But yet, when a plane crashes or explodes, we still see lawsuits. We still see settlements. Some of the biggest settlements ever, some of the Tom Girardi settlements were plane crashes. All those people signed waivers. When you, well, we just had the carnival ride where that young man tragically passed away. I, there are claim. I don't know if they filed a lawsuit, but I know there were claims filed. I bet there was money paid. Because even if somebody signs a waiver and you don't buckle the seatbelt, you don't test the harness, you don't do the maintenance like you should have, you can get around that waiver. You sign a waiver when you have a surgery. That doesn't mean if the doctor goes in and cuts off the wrong leg, they're like, well, sorry, you knew you could have even died in this surgery and you didn't die, so it could have been worse. It's like, no, no, you can still sue for that. And the reason is, we want waivers to be there so people can make knowing decisions. They can make educated decisions. They can make informed decisions. That's what we want. But we don't want to absolve people from paying attention when they're doing something like a surgery, when they're doing something like putting together a roller coaster, when they're flying planes, or when they're taking submarines down to the Titanic. If somebody is grossly negligent, a waiver is not going to protect them in most cases. You got to prove gross negligence, right? Willful and wanton disregard for human life or safety. Now, what does that mean? You've got to prove it to a jury. And gross negligence can mean different things to different people. Um, all right. So what did the passengers know? That's one of the big questions here. So let's queue up another video talking about the waiver. An experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. So they know that it has not been certified by any body and... That is experimental. So they do know that. Okay, that's some of what they know, but that's far from everything from what we've heard from all the other interviews and all the problems that it has had. With communications, with bolts being missing, with not having proper ways to just abort and end up at the top and be able to get yourself out because you couldn't get out from the inside. Where do I sign? CBS correspondent David Pogue reading from a waiver that Ocean Gate required it Customers to sign before boarding the submersible. With the five passengers on board, the Titan now presumed dead, there are significant questions as to whether that waiver will be enough to shield the company. Yes, the document appears to have gone into great detail about the risks of the journey. But does it really get Ocean Gate off the hook? In fact, is safety concerns have plagued this Titan sub for years. On a trip last summer, the Titan lost communication with its mothership for two and a half hours in an alarming incident documented by CBS. Back in did the passengers know about this? Maybe they did. I'm just saying, this is different than what he read from the waiver, that it's not certified by anybody and that it's experimental. That's only part of the problem here. That's only part of the risk. 2018, Ocean Gate fired former employee David Lockridge after he said he raised concerns about the safety of the Titan and advised the company to do more testing on the vessel's hull. Lockridge saying in court documents, quote, the paying passengers would not be aware and would not be informed on this experimental design, the lack of non-destructive testing of the hull or that hazardous flammable materials were being used within the submersible. Now, so 
some people, uh, you know, the former employee says again, fired disgruntled employee. If this was on trial, obviously that would be picked apart, but they would not be aware and would not be informed on the ex experimental design. Well, he's wrong about that because we saw that it was experimental in the waiver. Did they know about the lack of non-destructive testing of the hole or that hazardous flammable materials are being used within the submersible? submersible? Did they know that? He says no. We haven't heard it from a waiver yet. Obviously, I haven't read the whole waiver. I'd love to. Now, OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush, one of the five passengers presumed dead now, has long defended the safety of his submersibles. In 2017, he spoke out in support of a Cyclops II, an earlier version of the Titan. So before we hear what he has to say about this, in the waiver we're going to hear later, that it says the passengers were informed of the risk. Vague language like that has been fought for centuries in waivers. Is that specific enough, especially with all of the risk here and how risky it is? Is the fact that it just says they were informed enough, or does it have to spell out all or as many of the risks as they possibly can? Because when you use verbiage like they were informed of the risk, and then we hear the CEO talking like this, now it's... Now it's difficult. Somebody said this, that per, that employee was fired after he brought up the concerns. That's fair, but I don't know that. And I've, I'll just say, I've handled enough cases where disgruntled employees can be really honest and really dishonest, depending on the situation. So I don't, I'm not going to pretend like I know this guy's situation or gal. I don't even know if it was a per, woman or man. You believe the Cyclops 2 is pretty much invulnerable. By the time we're done testing it, I believe it's pretty much invulnerable. And that So he believes that this vessel, the Cyclops 2, was the one right before the Ocean Gate, is unsinkable. What does that sound like? That's pretty much what they said about the Titanic. That's right. <laughs> and I will go on all the first dives, put my money where my mouth is. That's pretty much what they said about the Titanic, and they laugh. I, I don't guess people are never going to learn, but I don't necessarily consider myself superstitious, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to say stuff like that. It's, it's so sad when it becomes a reality. But he said... It's impenetrable. It's not going to sink, just like the Titanic, when we're done testing it. And obviously, he says they're done testing it. Now, to be fair, he said he was going to be on it, and he was. So he did believe it was safe. He absolutely believed that. And he did. Still, there are serious questions about the equipment used to construct and operate the Titan. Speaking uh, with David Pogue, Stockton Rush showed off some of the no-frills parts he used to build the sub for which it charged passengers a quarter million dollars a piece. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> Come on! But despite these safety concerns, OceanGate does have those signed waivers. And by all accounts, they did not sugarcoat the risks. Mike Reese, a writer for The Simpsons, was on board for a previous OceanGate voyage and said the waiver was extremely clear. It is a very, very risky proposition. There's anyone who booked this trip knew it was gonna be risky. You sign a lengthy waiver that lists really a hundred ways to die. Things that So you sign a lengthy waiver that lists a hundred ways to die. So you could die from drowning, from a panic attack, from an implosion, from this, from that. That's fine. Just because it lists the way you can die doesn't mean you're informed of all the risks and how this thing was built, tested, or lack thereof, communication problems, problems coming back to the surface, no possibility of escape. Just because it lists ways to die does not mean that's specific enough. It could go wrong. So everyone walks into this with open, open eyes. Now, CNN obtained the waiver, and they report it mentioned the word death seven times. The waiver added, quote, I've been informed about the nature of the operation and the risks it presents, including when diving below the ocean surface, this vessel will be subject to extreme pressure and any failure of the vessel while I am on board could cause severe injury or death. So this right here is pretty important. And if this, in fact, is what happened, then it is waived. There are, there's a lot we don't know. Um, and somebody asked this question... Jill, does anyone know how it imploded, what caused it? At this point, I think the answer is a clear no. But they're going to gather as many parts as they possibly can. There will be testing done. There will be research into this. They will look for an answer. And if it was done because of a defect or building defect or maintenance issue, 
I expect them to be able to get around these waivers. If it was just because of the pressure and it couldn't withhold the pressure, then I think this waiver will potentially absolve them of all liability. Or it could be somewhere in between. Like they should have known based on testing, this could only make X amount of trips and they pushed it too far because I know we know that it is, they've taken multiple trips down there and there'll be more through the interviews on that later as well. So what happened is going to be a big question. Polls friend, the military and those in the know knew what happened Monday. Go listen to James Cameron interview about the matter. Yes. I've seen parts of it. I haven't watched the entire thing. Could this be similar to Elizabeth Holmes? Like, lying about a Ponzi scheme type of stuff. I don't think that's what it was because in fact, he was on the boat. And Scott, I'm glad I'm poor. We're going to talk about this, how these are not just nobodies doing this. There's no average Joe doing something like this. And that's going to come into play as well, especially when we talk about potential lawsuits and lawyers getting involved. And that was just one example of a potential catastrophic outcome the waiver outlined. Earlier this week, Pogue told News Nation there were many others. Several pages long, and it basically outlines paragraph by paragraph all the different things that could result in permanent disability or death. So they make very clear how dangerous this is. So there seems to be little question that OceanGate warned of the risks, but is that enough? Let's ask Peter Trago, so wrongful we're death and skip catastrophic this show. Perhaps something meaningful, then what would actually News Nation on your cable right. provider? And don't forget. You, luckily, you guys can get that analysis anytime. Oh, wait, actually... They played, I think, part of, um, maybe not. All right. Let's move to, so we, we saw that guy talking about it. He had a couple of interesting moments with Katie Couric that I want to pull up as well, talking about what he did or did not know, how he ended up there. So let's watch just a couple minutes of this as well. Math calculation is it's never been tested. They never they never put five people in there and started the clock and see how many days they'll last, let alone freezing cold people, let alone panicking people. The air goes much faster when you're breathing hard. You you know, you and your piece talked about how nervous you were, and somebody asked, like, you know, why did you agree to do this story? And were you <clears throat> Did you have second thoughts about it? And in a way, I feel like maybe you were lucky that the mission was aborted and you came up to the surface because there, but for the grace of God, go someone like you, Dave Pogue. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, at the time, remember this outfit has been in business for three years and each summer they go out for five week long expeditions Each expedition has the potential to visit the Titanic five times. So as of the time that I I visited, they had been to the Titanic 25 times, 23, something like that. And they'd never had an injury. They'd never had a death. The the craft had never broken. So I guess there's this thought in my head and my rational brain that says they wouldn't put us on this thing as journalists with a TV camera, if there's a risk that it's going to make them look bad, if the whole thing's going to kill somebody. So I don't know if you guys caught that, but as I'm thinking to it, and maybe I'll back it up and we'll listen to it again. So they tell us this stuff, but in my mind, I'm thinking it's got to be safe. We're journalists. We've got cameras. In my mind, I'm thinking nobody's ever gotten hurt. And he's regurgitating the fact that that's what the CEO has said in other interviews. We've never had an injury. We've never had a death. We've never had a problem. First off, he says three years like that's 500 years. Anybody that's been doing anything for three years realize that uh, that's not that long of a time. And he was told that information, in my opinion, by OceanGate. Oh, look, we've been doing it for this long. I go down every time. Nobody's ever gotten hurt before. Well, nobody was ever hurt in a car with no seatbelt until they did. Nobody ever died of eating something that had poison in it or toxins that they didn't know about until they did. And the question is always, should you have known the car was dangerous before the seatbelt? And maybe the answer is no. Should you have known that this 
food was going to kill children under 15 before you gave it to them. I'm just making that up. And the answer sometimes is for the should you have known is, did you do enough testing? Did you understand what you were getting into? Because if we are going to be partaking in inherently dangerous activities, if we are going to allow people to sign waivers like this, don't you think we should do all the testing? And I realize the answer is, well, that costs a lot of money. It costs millions of dollars to put these excursions together. That's why it costs $250,000 a ticket. Would we not as a society rather spend the money before spending the lives? That's how I look at it. Not allowing something like this until, in fact, we can prove that it's safe, send cameras down there, send test tubes down there, whatever. That's tough for me. That's tough. But he said in his mind, he thought it was safe. And I'll just back it up so we can listen to it again real quick. The time that I, had, I visited, they had been to the Titanic 25 times. 23, something like that. This is all information I think he got from them. And they'd never had an injury. They'd never had a death. The, the craft had never broken. So I guess there's this thought in my head and my rational brain that says they wouldn't put us on this thing as journalists with a TV camera, if there's a risk that it's going to make them look bad, if the whole thing's going to kill somebody. So, so that's what he says there. But she asks him straight up, who do you think is liable? And he says, it's clear. It is clear who is liable in this situation. Take a second, put in the chat who you think he is going to say is liable or who has to take the blame for the damages in this case. Who do you think he said? The travel industry that you mentioned. I'm such a chicken. I would never do anything like this. I'm too, too afraid. And uh, I just, I wouldn't take the risk. But a lot of people are willing to do that. And I guess the question is, you know, who's liable if things go wrong? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty clear when you, when you sign your life away. You, you assign no blame to the company you you say i mean it it just says in essence we're going to do everything so most of you are putting ocean gate owner ceo but no he says the passengers said ocean gate has no liability they have waived it and that is clear to him as someone who has signed this waiver i think that's important I really think that's important. Yeah, now some people are coming in with the passengers. Yeah, that's what he said. But as you listen to these words that are incredibly important, if this was his deposition, this is just what I would do. I would let him answer the question like this, assuming I represent the victims. I would let him answer the question like this and then potentially follow up after he continues because he says it's the passengers. John 100,000% agrees with this man. But let's listen to how he explains why the passengers should have the liability after they sign the waiver. We can, you say, I mean, it, it just says, in essence, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to take every reasonable precaution. And, and they do. I mean, there's... Did you catch that? He said the passengers have the liability because they signed it away. And basically... All OceanGate said was, we have to do everything reasonable, take all reasonable precautions to make it safe for you. Well, there you go. Did they do that? That's why we're here. That is the question. Because if they did, if they did everything they were supposed to, if they built it properly, maintained it properly, tested it properly, if they did all that, then maybe he's right. But even he who thinks the passengers have all have signed away all liability, so they're taking responsibility for it. Even he says, only if Ocean Gate did this. I'm going to back it up one more time just because it's a little 
choppy here. You you say, I mean, it, it just says in essence, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to take every reasonable precaution. And, and they do. I mean, there's checklists and, you know, drills and uh, mandatory meetings twice a day. They, they do a lot of very safety conscious cultural things. So he said, and they do. So his opinion is they do. Judy asks a great question. What's reasonable? Kimberly said is not having it tested reasonable. These are what we call jury questions. Kristen asked the same thing. A lot of you picking up on it. He even said they have checklists and mandatory meetings twice a day and this, that, and the other. Guess what? If they did all of that, okay. But if they made their lists of what is reasonable and then they did not stick to those lists and those checklists and those meetings, are the waivers null and void? These are the kinds of questions that come along with experiences like this. Really, really interesting stuff, just kind of to piece together. We still have a couple more, two more short videos we're going to watch together. Uh, they were part of the Explorer community. The risks were all known and documented. They were smart enough and had the resources and chose to take the risk. 19-year-old followed his dad blindly. So this very well may be true. and Maybe they did know everything. And I think at least two or three of them on this vessel maybe did. But I think it's very common that multiple people can be on this as passengers and know different things. Some of them maybe did make a knowing waiver. Some of them maybe didn't. And I think this is the point. We're hearing different opinions in here because if you all were jurors, I think some of you would be convinced of the waiver, that it was a knowing waiver. Some of you may be convinced it wasn't. Some may be convinced it rose to the level of gross negligence. Some of you will say it doesn't. And that's what makes this conversation really interesting. Rosie, how many have agreed to terms of service and read them all? So here's a question for the chat. Has anybody here been on a roller coaster, been on a plane or gotten a surgery? And did you read all of what you were waving? Did you feel like you had a choice? Maybe on the roller coaster you felt like you did, but on a plane, especially for work, for a family emergency. How about a surgery? Do you really have a choice? And then if something were to go wrong because somebody didn't care enough to do things the right way or didn't practice or didn't make sure the thing was safe or maintain it, would you have thought that that was fair and you waived all liability to that? Dark Arts by Adrian. Sub brief YouTube channel creator Aaron, 20 plus year Navy submarine expert would be great to have on for all the construction issues and lack of oversight. Thank you for covering this. Yeah. I mean, I, and we're going to hear from, I think, one more. Uh, I think we're going to hear from one more person that that is an expert kind of like this. Robin, regardless of waiver, company negligence wasted significant resources for rescue. That should be criminal. I do see people pretty upset about how much time and money was spent on on the recovery, but I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be one to complain about that. I, If you have a chance to save somebody, I think we do it. Lauren B, unless you say into the waiver, unless you start putting that into the waiver, if you get lost, nobody's coming to find you. Maybe that should be something that's in the waiver, honestly. Lauren B, the whistleblower case from 2018 will be forefront in discussions. The CEO was quoted as saying safety is a waste. And I think we're going to hear more about that. Net woman, the passenger signed the waiver, not the family. Uh, can the family sue? Again, if, you, if you're the person that signs a valid waiver and it was not rise to the level of gross negligence or an unknowing waiver or coercion, then you are allowed to waive your own rights and your family still would not be able to file suit. But a lot of questions as to what exactly happened. Tom, Peter, a big thanks to Azam, Nicole W., Tori, John, and all who gifted memberships. Amazing group of people. I could not agree more. And for anybody that doesn't think that there are lawsuits potentially coming, I want to listen to a short interview with the CEO or co-owner or whoever this guy is, some something partners with the CEO that was on um, the vessel and hear what he has to say and kind of respond to some of what's out there. 
was ago, we spoke with Guillermo Sunline, who co-founded Ocean Gate 14 years ago with Stockton Rush. He talked about his friend and business partner and the risks explorers will continue to take. So first, Guillermo, you posted- You hear how he said the risk explorers will continue to take. So it's not over. A heartfelt message to social media that said in part, you were holding out hope. What have these past few days been like and what has been your reaction to the news? Yeah, it's been, as you can imagine, an incredible roller coaster of emotions over the past three days. I first found out that they lost communications with the sub on Monday, and the first 24 hours were especially difficult. Uh, and now I've spent the past two or three days preparing myself for this kind of outcome. But let's honestly, looking, uh, listening to the Coast Guard press conference, the finality of their findings is, is still difficult to, to deal with. I can't even imagine what the families of the crew are going through or what the uh, team members at Ocean Gate are going through after spending these past four days trying to, to find and rescue their teammates. It truly is unimaginable. And in that same post, you also noted that when you co-founded Ocean Gate, your mission was to open the oceans for all humanity. So here's an important part. And one of the reasons I want to play this, because it's like, why? Why take this risk? Why are we here? Why are people doing this? Because there are people that really believe in this stuff. And, and he's going to explain it now, how important it is and, you know, why he wants to do this for people and with people using crude submersibles. So what was your vision and how did you end up partnering with Stockton Rush? So Stockton and I met in 2008 and we shared this common passion for exploration, uh, especially of extreme environments, both space and oceans. And in 2009, we founded Ocean Gate specifically to open up the oceans for all of humanity so that we could learn more about the oceans, so we could explore the oceans, and so ultimately we could preserve the oceans. And I know that's the one thing that really drove Stockton throughout the entire time uh, doing Ocean Gate. So co-founding this company, were there red flags? Did you ever have concerns that something like this could happen? Well, first of all, all of us that are involved in exploration of the deep oceans understand that there are substantial risks operating under such extreme conditions. We know that better than anybody because that is the office in which we play. Uh, Stockton was one of the most uh, diligent engineers and pilots that I'd ever met throughout my career in ocean exploration. And uh, contrary to how some folks in social media and online have been portraying him. Uh, he was not a risk taker. He was very much a risk manager. If anything, he was fully committed to safety. And every innovation that he came up with was with the intent of pushing the bounds of what was possible for underwater exploration while also improving safety. So what sort of impact do you think this will have on the future of underwater exploration? Well, obviously, right now, it's too early to say anything because uh, I know everybody wants answers. I want answers. The families want answers. The crew wants answers. Uh, and there'll be a time for that, and they'll be collecting data over the coming days and weeks. Uh, depending on what comes out of that, uh, the, co the community, the ocean exploration community, will take a lot of lessons learned and move forward. Exploration. They'll take a lot of lessons learned and move forward. So uh, another question I've been getting a lot of. Aren't they just going to go bankrupt? Aren't they going to go away? Is there going to be nothing to sue? Number one, that could be true. Number two, there could be insurance. And even if a company goes defunct or bankrupt, there could be stays in the process. We don't need to dig into the weeds on that. But if there's insurance in place, that could still be collectible. However, it is insanely difficult to insure activities that are this dangerous and this unregulated and this uncertified and this untested. So my guess is there ain't an insurance company in the world that would insure this. Could be wrong. There could be insurance. But if there's not, then the other question is, if this is so unsafe that nobody would want to touch it, why didn't they get the certifications? Why didn't they do the testing in order to get the insurance? It's all, it's all an interesting discussion around everything. All right, I'm going to answer a couple more questions, and then we will get to our last video. Katrina, regulations are so important as the Navy submarines have enormous regulatory practices. Yes, and it costs a lot of money. In other countries, same things. And th that's how I think James Cameron did it with, like, other people talk about Russian submarines. Um, it's just, it's a different beast. Obviously, way more expensive, but... 
it just seems incredibly sad to risk lives for this. Erica, shout out from Kentucky. Actually flying to St. Pete Clearwater later today for a little fun. Any good restaurant suggestions? Love the channel and content. I would love to give you some suggestions. Hit me up on uh, Twitter or Instagram, at Trago's Law. Send me a DM and I'll give you some suggestions. K-Rab, I just had cataract surgery and signed the waiver, but that would not protect the doctor if they were negligent. Correct, to, to most levels, correct. Robin, sorry, absolutely should have used resources, but companies should be held accountable. Yeah, the company should have to pay for that. They can if there's insurance in place. Belinda, the adult males on board knew and could assess the risks logically. I'm crying for the mom of the teenage boy who wanted to please his dad. It's tragic. Yeah, that's, I mean, that part of the story was just, it's unbearable. Holly, do you sign waivers on bungee jumping? Yes, but if the attendant forgets to tie the bungee jump on or gives you one that's 10 feet longer than the drop, so you just land on the floor, those are things you can sue for. Patty, welcome to the membership crew. Stina G, to be fair, without risk and exploration, there are no new discoveries. I agree. Until this, no subs were ever lost at the Titanic, but they had all been tested. Here's the point. There were still ways to get down to the Titanic. There were still ways to explore it. There were still, way, there were still ways to see it. But they were more expensive. They have all this red tape. They're controlled by governments of different nations. So I get that there were issues and there wasn't open exploration, but you don't see all of us just, I mean, it's, it's in the process, I guess, of us going to outer space and making it easier for people to do. But- I think there should be liability if you do that stuff. Try to put a camera on it and send it up there. Figure out a way to put a camera on a boat and sink it down there and make a chain long enough to pull it up. I realize there are pressure issues and all sorts of issues with that. I'm just saying with today's technology and the amount of time, if we really care about this stuff, I think we can risk money and we can risk technology before we risk lives, especially when it didn't seem like they were going to do anything that was great for society down there, but instead just see the Titanic. I say just, I don't mean to belittle what they were doing because it is a big deal to them. It just, it's really sad to look back at now. Bad cat, mad cat. All the insurance companies who specialize in this industry rejected them. There was no insurance. This is the least surprising thing I've seen in the chat. Thank you, bad cat, for confirming this. I had not seen this anywhere. Uh, Nico, are waivers worth anything if the company does not tell the signers about not being able to insure or not having certified or testing it properly? So, Yes and no. It's, this is all fact question, but I think we would argue whether this was reasonable. We would argue, argue whether they should have. And I think they did tell them some of this stuff, but I think there's so much that a lawyer is going to be able to point to and be like, there's no way you told them about this. There's no way they understood this. No way they understood that. And I think they're going to be able to use some of these public interviews where they say, oh, it's so safe. It's unsinkable. All the testing we're doing on it to be able to say the way that you publicly talked about this was just false. Hippie babe, who is financially responsible for the rescue um, or the end findings? The rescue is the taxpayers. That's who paid for the rescue or the search, I should say. Okay, so let's get to this last video where, again, it is, I believe this is a, an engineer expert talking about all of the issues that he saw um, with this sub. Like Hot Stew is pretty much invulnerable. By the time we're done testing it, I believe it's pretty much invulnerable. And that's pretty much what they said about the Titanic. That's right. <laughs> and I will go on all the first dives, put my money where my mouth is. That was Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush doubling down in 2017 that, that right? his submersible, a version before the one that's currently missing, was on the missing sub, the Titan. Safety concerns, though, have plagued this, which was documented in a Lockridge after he said he raised concerns about the safety of the Titan would not be of the response information that it's like leading insurer in the underwater and marine tech industry quote wouldn't touch ocean gate with a barge pole and refuse to insure them oh we here we go that was, there was our answer right there the agency now we are also learning that it's likely ocean gate didn't even have insurance for the titan vessel a chartered marine scientist telling news nation the leading insurer in the underwater and marine tech industry quote wouldn't touch ocean gate with a barge pole and refuse to insure them he also believes that four to five other top marine insurance companies refuse to insure ocean gate now, as we mentioned, the search continues tonight for the five missing, including a father and son and British billionaire Hamish Harding. Joining me now is Harding's friend, Chris Brown, who had paid to go on the mission. 
with Harding, but backed out due to safety concerns. Thanks. Oh, that's right. So this is the guy that was going to go and backed out because of sa safety concerns. So we're going to talk about who this evidence would be better for and why. So much for coming on the program. Appreciate it. So talk to us about exactly why you decided not to go on the mission. Um, yeah, first, a, a slight correction. It, it wouldn't have been on this exact dive, uh, necessarily. I, I just paid to go on a, a very similar dive. Um, it, it, all, it was back in 2017 um, as one of the earlier investors in, in the program um, with the scientific view of going down and doing a 3D scan of the Titanic. They set um, different milestones where your deposit ramped up. So if they hit the first milestone, you paid more in a deposit. They constantly missed those milestones. They weren't hitting the depths that they were supposed to be doing. Uh, which was the first alert in my direction. Um, secondly, when they were doing some testing out in the Bahamas, I was aware of them using um, like industrial piping, scaffolding type stuff as a ballast, which I thought was a bit amateurish. They made a bit of a play on the controller, um, which sounded like fun, but I did think, well, surely you could have developed something a bit more professional. And then as time went by and they missed more and more depths, by the end of November 2018, um, I started pressing them on certification. And it became evident that not only did they not have certification, they weren't going to try and even get certification for going down to 3,800 meters mm. once, let alone several times. Um, and at that point, I thought, these risks are beyond what I can mitigate in my own head. So I withdrew from the program. Did, did you speak directly with Stockton Rush, the, the CEO? I didn't deal with the okay. now, and through an intermediary. Did you express any of your... So one of the things that's interesting about this is while this is all bad for OceanGate, obviously, um, that they were having these issues, that they weren't hitting their benchmarks, that they weren't hitting um, the depths that they were supposed to be hitting, all of that is bad for OceanGate. But what's good for OceanGate is this guy knew about all that. This guy decided to back out and was allowed to. This guy didn't go. So the ones that did, they knew about all this stuff too. They understood what was going on. They made a knowing decision to get on the sub. And they were able to sign those waivers and waive liability on the part of OceanGate. John said, try turning this down and maybe it, they won't freeze as much. So we'll see if that helps. Concerns to your friend who is now on that vessel? Um, I expressed my concern to two different friends, um, both of whom pulled out at different stages, uh, not directly with Hamish, no. Um, I, I, I want to play a piece of sound from Stockton Rush because he talked about some of the safety issues and why he didn't think it was that dangerous. This is number three. I don't think it's very dangerous. If you look at uh, submersible uh, activity over the last three decades, there hasn't even been a, a major injury. Uh, let Again, alone major this is the CEO who was on the sub. This is what he's saying publicly in November of 2022. So I, I just have a very, this to me is very strong evidence of what he was saying to the passengers before they got on the sub. It probably sounded a lot like this. And is this accurate? Now, I don't think he was lying, but was there things he didn't know? This is this is all just really tough because he obviously believed it because he continued to go. Mentality. What worries us is not once you're underwater. What worries me is when I'm getting you there, when you're on the ship in the icy states with big doors that can crush your hands and people who may not have the best balance who fall down, uh, bang their head. That's that's to me the dangerous part. Mm -hmm. But the scary part for most people is you know, going down to 6,000 PSI. When you were talking to them about going on the vessel, is that what they said to you about the safety concerns that, look, we're not really worried about the big picture stuff. We're really more worried about smaller injuries? Um, it, we didn't get into that detail, the discussion on the risks and dangers, uh, purely because it hadn't progressed that far. Um, I think my opinion on the risks and dangers are the complete opposite. <laughs> I think uh, moving around the, the mothership would be relatively safe compared to being in a, um, an experimental vessel going down. So he said this is just his research and what he found out and his risks of safety were very different than the CEO just described there. Down to 3,800 meters. It's very deep. 
did, did they make it clear it's experimental? Because, you know, we've had a number of people on who have been defending the company, basically saying everyone who goes on this knows how incredibly risky it is. And these are not tourists. They are explorers. They're experienced people, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure about their sales policy. I would definitely count myself as an explorer and aware of risks, probably why I pulled out. Hamish is a very experienced explorer, um, done lots of expeditions. He'd be aware of the risks. He took a different view on those risks. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come and on. So, the so he described one of the explorers on there as understanding the risks and doing it knowingly, but he doesn't know if everybody else did. And that's, again, there could be very different, very big differences between the different passengers. Patty D, will they try to regulate international waters? This is so difficult. Who regulates it? Who has final say? What is the proper jurisdiction? All that stuff's very difficult. I don't know the answer to that. John, the clients or passengers had to build some rapport or some report with the Ocean Gate to trust them with their lives. They had to. Oh, I agree. I think that they did trust them. It's just, did they know everything? Was everything explained to them appropriately? Or were so, so, uh, certain things not explained to them like the disgruntled, I don't, I don't want to call them disgruntled employee, like the ex-employee said. Bryce, how much did how much do you want to bet the billionaire lawyers reviewed and consulted them? Also, random fact, Titan is the name of the fictional boat that sunk in the sea prior to the Titanic. Yeah, I think that's why they named it the Titanic, right? There was something to do with that. I, I mean, I guess, but this would not necessarily be a contract a lawyer would read, I don't think. Um, it's not like somebody buying a business or making some kind of business deal. Lawyers don't review contracts of their clients before they sign them when they go into surgery. So I don't know. I mean, this is just, this is a really tough topic. I apologize for the technical difficulties. I know some of the videos were freezing and stuff, so I appreciate you bearing with us. Um, and I do apologize for that. I apologize for the content that it's sad and another tragedy that we're discussing here, but I'm doing my best to answer your questions, help understand how the, the civil justice system could affect a situation like this, um, how it could affect you in your lives with waivers and inherently dangerous activities um, and what you should look out for and always ask questions. Don't let anybody make you feel like you can't ask a question, ask questions. And if you want to back out of something, back out just like this guy did, it saved his life. So I, I just, I want to make sure we, we finish with, with those kinds of comments and anybody that doesn't want to stick around for these, I understand. Um, hit that like button. If you do want to continue with this content so that I know, and we can kind of act accordingly. Azam, thank you for the super sticker on the way out. You guys are the best. I appreciate it. This is why I do it, to have these kinds of discussions. Um, so I appreciate you so much. Oh, we hit 245,000. That's awesome. Yeah, hit that subscribe button. We are so close to 250K. Um, we'll do some fun stuff, not sad content then, uh, hopefully, for that video. Did passengers have access to benchmark shortfalls info? I don't know. I don't know what they had access to. It seems like some of them had access to certain things and some of them did not. So I don't know. A lot of unanswered questions here still. But that would make a difference, wouldn't it? Thank you, Julie, so much. I had some people also saying from the last one from News Nation, no way this guy's a lawyer. Um, I am. I know I might not look like a lawyer, what you think a lawyer looks like, which is totally cool as well. Um, but if you want to learn a little bit about what my firm does and how you can find our website and confirm, I have gone to law school, I try cases, I'm a civil trial lawyer, used to do criminal trial stuff, um, then stick around for the outro. Cause I'm out of here. I'll check you guys later. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.